So thank you for the opportunity to highlight BP's Bioscience Center to the ICANN network, as well as talk to you guys about how biology plays a role in the oil and gas industry. So my agenda for today is today's talk is going to be the following. I'm first going to give you a general introduction to BP, as well as the Bioscience Center and our capability. I'm then going to give you a view of the platforms that the Bioscience Group works on in terms of project areas, with a few examples of work that we do in the biofuel space. And then I'm going to turn our attention to two areas that we work on, which we thought would be most interesting to the ICAM network. The first on our work in biosouring and microbial-induced corrosion, which we also call MIC. And then secondly, we thought to go through some case studies on the use of metagenomics and data mining and how that helps identify solutions for BP. So I'm not sure how well any of you understand how integrated oil and gas companies work, so I thought I'd start with the basics. So there's two main business units. Um, in an integrated oil co company like BP. These are called upstream and downstream. The upstream part of the company is what people normally associate with an oil company, drilling for oil. For BP, this means not just oil, but also for natural gas. The activities in our upstream business include things like field development and production, as well as things like midstream transportation, storage, and processing. The other side is our downstream business. This is the part of the business that takes the oil and refines it into products such as gas or petrol, chemicals, and lubricants. And finally, for BP, this functions group works to support both the upstream and downstream and is responsible for areas such as compliance, reporting, finance and ethics, um, sorry, finance and ethics and compliance. So included in this functions group is where we, the BSC sits, which is an area called group technology shown down here. So group technology, again, that's sitting under that functions manager uh, banner, supports technology development and deployment across BP's businesses and helps to develop the science capability for the company, as well as look at long-term research. The Biosciences Center, again, what we call BSC, is part of group research, which is under group technology. Our center was formed in May of 2015 and hosts about 30 scientists and engineers with backgrounds in biology, chemistry, and chemical engineering. And again, not to brag, as Alex said, but we're located in sunny Southern California in San Diego. So the remit of the BSC is really, what can biology do for an oil company? The short answer is, a lot. Most of BP's businesses are actually dealing with biology in some form, for both good and bad. So the BSC looks for how biosciences can add value to our existing businesses, and then implement research and development programs towards this. We can also help look for academic or external programs to complement business needs. The group also provides support to businesses that already operate biological processes. So, for, so a good example of this would be our uh, Brazil sugarcane ethanol business, which I'm going to briefly talk about a few slides from now, as well as develop differentiated molecules. Our activity is spread from short-term to long-term, and we cover both technical service as well as fundamental research and development. So this slide gives you an overview of the range of capability in the BSC. Our, group, our largest group consists of these biologists and biochemists, and this group can cover a wide range of biological subjects such as microbiology, metabolic engineering, and enzymology. But we also have chemists, including an organic chemist, not on this list, and heterogeneous catalyst chemists, as well as chemical engineers that specialize in areas such as ASPEN and CFD modeling, as well as techno-economics. So you may think that for such a small group of 30 people, we have such a wide diversity of specialties, but the reality is that nobody can develop a full solution on their own. It takes a village. So this is the BSC village. So some of the unique capability I thought I would quickly highlight in the BSC is the ability to do full systems biology. For those of you not familiar with this, this capability is often also referred to as omics and is the measurement or understanding of all of the internal metabolites and proteins and genetic material in a strain. This includes genomics, which is the DNA sequence of the organism, transcriptomics, but, um, the measurement of expression of the genes from the organism's genome under specific conditions, proteomics, again, the measurement of all the proteins expressed under a specific condition, and finally, metabolomics, which is a measurement of the internal metabolites within a cell, again, under specific conditions. With all of this information, we can then build metabolic models for our organisms. 
And I think of this like a biologist version of an Aspen model. And we have the measurements to both confirm our um, model as well as look for areas where we can improve the model. In addition to the equipment and methodology in the BSC, another unique thing we have is a biodiversity library that was started from one of the original companies that BP acquired called Diversa Corporation. This library consists of samples collected over a period of about 20 years from all over the world, including, including places like deep sea thermal vents, halophilic lakes, and hot springs. Most of this collection is simply the DNA, or the environmental DNA, shown here. Um, as our knowledge on how to culture microorganisms is actually quite limited. And we can only truly culture the tip of the iceberg, as we call it, when it comes to these organisms. So by isolating the DNA, we've now preserved this unique genetic information, and we can use it to access it from both a sequence basis as well as screen it randomly and look for specific activity. So again, this collection co consists of microbial isolates, the eDNA. There's gene libraries that have been made. We have sequenced information as well subclone genes as well, as well as some lyophilized proteins if you want to study the proteins independently. All in all, we have about 80,000 tubes and plates and vials of, these, of, of this material. OK, so this brings me to the platforms that we have in the BSC. We have four platforms that we're focused on, biofuels, bioproducts, biotreatments, and as well as engineering, chemistry, and advanced modeling. So the area I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth is this platform here, biotreatment. But first, I thought I would give you a view of our biofuels platform. EP owns and operates three sugarcane mills in Brazil, all of them located here, shown in this little green helio. Our three mills have a combined ethanol production capacity of 10,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day, as well as an operation that spans the entire value chain. So we make not only bioethanol, but we also make sugar and power from the burning of the leftover bagasse material. In the past five years, we've more than doubled our production of bioethanol. And in 2016, our three sites produced around 800 million liters of ethanol. We estimate that since we started our operations, we've avoided about 2.3 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is equal to removing about 1.1 million cars off the road each year. A good accomplishment. In addition to our sugarcane ethanol mills in Brazil, our biofuels business is also developing, in conjunction with DuPont, isobutanol, which is an advanced biomolecule that can enable a greater penetration of biofuels into liquid transportation fuels. This company is called Butamax, and there's their symbol, which is, they actually just recently purchased a corn ethanol mill in Kansas, which is going to be used to retrofit the first commercial demonstration plant for this technology. So exciting times ahead. Some other areas that we're interested in and developing future work streams on include wastewater, um, where we're focused on our refining and petrochemical plants. We're looking to ways to minimize the waste to landfill, and that includes improved degradation of the calcitrant material, as well as ideas around converting some of the waste streams to biogas. Also looking at remediation, of which there's lots of areas of interest, including, including looking for ways to deal with firefighting foam. Um, these are perfluorinated compounds. We're also looking at enhanced oil recovery, or EOR, to improve our ability to get more oil out of each well. So now I'm going to turn to our um, biotreatment platform. So I'm going to focus on two areas within our biotreatment platform. These are biosouring and microbial-induced erosion, or MIC. platform in my group. Uh, in my group is led by Reinhard Dermarmer, shown here. So what is biosouring? So biosouring is the microbial reduction of sulfate to sulfide, and it's arguably the most deleterious microbial process that oil operators face during oil production. The sulfide that's formed present, presents health risks to workers when present in the gas phase as hydrogen sulfide, and needs to be removed from the crude oil before it can be refined. And so this results in a more expensive end product. Sulfide is also highly corrosive. So it requires significant investment in corrosion-resistant infrastructure, hence the play here for advanced materials. BP, like many other oil companies, carries risks in this area, as a significant portion of BP's production wells are under seawater flood, which has sulfate in it, which can be reduced to sulfide by the microbes in the subsurface. And to compound this issue, the susceptibility of the various reservoirs to sour varies greatly 
So our ability to develop mitigation strategies is difficult. The application of nitrate has been BP's main barrier against souring, but this has been inconsistent in its effectiveness. Basically, similar to other engineering problems, when we look at souring, we apply what's called a bow tie approach. So hopefully you can sort of see a bow tie. There's your middle button, there's one loop and the other loop. So you have the event in the middle, the threat on one side, and the consequence on the other. When assessing the bow tie, we separate out the risk from the threat occurring, the actual event, as well as the outcome, and then develop mitigation strategies to either eliminate or control the threat, as well as develop treatment should the actual event occur. We look for answers to both sides of the bow tie, but a strong focus is on preventing the risk in the first place. If we talk about threat for this left side, we look at things like prediction, prevention, and monitoring. Um, we've approached this through things like joint industry projects, what we call GIPs, with industry partners, and directly funded academic research. Through those efforts, we're trying to get a better understanding of the fundamental science behind souring, develop predictive models, characterize new barriers, as well as look for new ways to monitor and predict the souring events. So for example, in the use of things like sulfur isotopes. Right now, the only means, other than capping a well, if concentrations get too high, um, the only way to treat hydrogen sulfide that gets through is to actually apply scavenger chemistry. The, scavenger, the existing scavenger chemistries are expensive and inefficient, and they may also cause issue, issue, uh, issues for the downstream refining of the oil. So in essence, what you try to do is reduce the likelihood that the event's going to occur, as well as reduce the impact if it happens. The Biosciences Center's focus is on the threat, so this left-hand side of the bow tie and understanding the fundamental biology of the system. To that end, we've developed specific experimental capabilities to do this. So we have small scale um, culture capability. So this would consist of flasks and serum bottles. These are serum bottles that you can stop right here to create an anaerobic environment, as well as an anaerobic glove box uh, to do the anaerobic work. We also have a sand column set up. This is a picture of our new sand column. Um, which consists of small columns with sand packed in it and which mimics the reservoir for the flow of fluids through it. We've designed ours for, throw, for throughput, flow precision, and we can also control the temperature. We do use a third party in Manchester called Raw Water to do experiments with higher pressure. And finally, our center also has full metagenomics capability, which means that we can determine the microorganisms that are present in a soured system using their DNA, and I'm going to go through this type of work a little later on with another piece of work my group has done. So what activities does my group work on in this area? Well, for one, we're heavily involved in the reservoir modeling work. The goal is to develop a model that can predict and analyze biosouring in the reservoirs. Currently, the business applies a commercial model called SourSim. Um, that's, uh, that's being developed by a, a JIP. Uh, this model takes a similar approach to the reservoir which gives us balancing predictions and predicting scouring behavior in a specific reservoir. So this model, however, is still in development and still pretty crude. But in, in the end, it has to be applicable and it can't be too detailed or it would take too long to generate predictions due to the computational time and processing. Capacity that's needed. So, therefore, in parallel, we've been working, we've been funding an academic collaboration with the Energy Biosciences Institute, or ABI, with a group of researchers about, at both UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. This group at LBNL has been working on its own model called TUP, which is far more detailed, has more complexity, applies more factors, and is therefore very useful as an RD tool to model souring behavior and gain new insights into souring behavior. So we use this to understand the key factors of souring behavior as well as souring mitigation. As I mentioned, BP, as well as many of the other oil, major oil producers, use nitrate treatment as a way to control biosouring. Companies deploy nitrate down a well, and that seems to control the souring to some extent, but not always. So why does it not always work? Well, it turns out that the underlying biology in the well, so the microorganisms in the subsurface contributes to how well the nitrate deployment works. So if we can understand this biology, 
we can better use nitrate to control the souring. In the subsurface, there's two key groups of bacteria. There's lots, but these are the two key groups that are of interest to us. We have the nitrate-reducing bacteria, shown here in green, and then the sulfate-reducing bacteria, the SRBs, as we call them, shown in red. As nitrate is applied, it actually promotes the growth of the NRBs. So they actually outcompete the SRB population, and this helps to um, reduce the production of the hydrogen sulfide. The nitrate can affect the SRBs in different ways, but unfortunately, this has not always been reliable for controlling souring. Therefore, understanding these two groups of bacteria and how nitrate and other treatments affect them and the production of hydrogen sulfide is key to coming up with a solution, including how we can dose nitrate more effectively. So there's still lots to learn and understand. Another area of concern is microbial influence corrosion, or MIC. MIC is the influence of microorganisms on the kinetics of the corrosion process of the metal, which is caused by the microorganisms adhering to the surfaces, what we um, call biofilm. Microorganisms in pipelines, for example, can attach to surfaces and bend themselves in slime. So you see this here. This is the, what we call the extra poly, or extracellular polymeric substance, or EPS, and form layers, the biofilm. So these can um, be very thin, so think of monolayers, but can reach the thickness of centimeters, as in, in the case of microbial mass. These biofilms are characterized by a strong heterogeneity. Understanding these biofilms, how they start, their adherence to the metal surface, and how they grow is critical in our understanding and mediation of the risk. I'm sure you can all sense that one of my desires is for a Teflon type of or coating that does not enable microbial attachment to the surface. And here's my cartoon again. Think of a biofilm as a party. If you can't attach, then the party doesn't happen. No party, no biofilm, no corrosion. The answer, of course, has to also be economical as well as practical, because there's millions of miles of pipeline. The BOC's role in this area is to help provide biological expertise in how to detect, prevent, and remediate NEC across BP systems in both upstream and downstream. The two initial areas we're focusing on are to ensure that we have a standardized microbial sampling strategy across BP, and then to use this genomic data from this to correlate which microorganisms are there and what is the risk to corrosion. And secondly, to help standardize the approach to the use of biocides. Again, with many wells and many geographies, we don't use a standard approach to using biocides. So this will involve Understanding the mode of action of the biocides we, we use now. Understanding what dosing levels are appropriate, appropriate for the various biocides. Ensuring we have a methodology for ensuring that the biocide actually does its job. And finally, to anticipate any secondary effects from the application. And so this could include understanding what byproducts could end up in the waste stream that would need to be dealt with. To give you a taste of some of the academic collaborations we have going on in corrosion across BP, this includes a program called Managing Microbial Corrosion in Canadian Offshore and Onshore Oil Production Operations, which is coordinated at the University of Calgary, but which also includes Memorial University of Newfoundland, the University of Alberta, Dow, Shell, and DNB. This program is focused on using genomics to better understand, model, and predict MIC and its evolution. We're also part of an NSERC, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, industrial research project in petroleum microbiology, which is led by Professor Garrett Boudreau, Boudreau at the University of Calgary. The goal of this project is to address problems that are relevant to re reservoir souring, MIC, and enhanced oil recovery. And this includes understanding the fundamentals of the biology, as well as development of tools that are relevant for this area of study. And finally, of course, BP is invested in ICAM, and we're beginning to explore this area where we have some interest in biofilm resistant materials as well as in biofilm sensors. So, overall, our goal from our microbiology platform is to be able to predict, control, and monitor microbiology through the integration of both our knowledge and operational know how. Together, this will help us to understand how biology affects our businesses. This chart depicts where we are currently on our journey. We spent the most effort so far in, this, in the area of biosouring, but we've been ramping up our efforts on corrosion with the upstream technology, or UTU. Um, BP has also made a strong play into the world of biogas, 
And so we've been familiarizing ourselves with this topic and starting to understand how we can provide input. And finally, looking to the future, areas like wastewater and remediation are obvious next areas to pursue and thus continue to broaden our portfolio. As we develop the capabilities to support our current activities, at the same time, we'll be growing the foundation to work on new areas that require similar capabilities. Now, slightly switching gears, we thought we'd give you two case studies on why metagenomics and data mining are so important. And the leader for this area is our senior computational biologist, Tom Goldman. So, the first case study is on an early phase study, what we call a phrase, and understanding the microbial population in pipes in Alaska. This is important because corrosion in the pipeline system causes serious damage to the environment and loss of production to a company. If corrosion caused by microbes, the MEC, could be eliminated, then there would be a huge benefit to all. This sounded like a great idea, so the crew in Alaska worked with one of the service providers, in this case a company called NALCO, who was contracted to do the microbial speciation um, data. So basically the data of which microbes were present as well as how many were present. However, there did end up being too much variation in the data because they did not use standardized sampling nor consistent processing of those samples. Just knowing the microorganisms present was not really enough to help make any recommendations or changes to their current operations. Therefore, we were asked to look at the system and come up with a standardized approach to the extraction, sequencing, and analysis of the samples taken at the site, and then to use this data to help provide insight into detecting and or treating the MEC. So this is the analysis workflow that we used for the project. Samples were taken in the form of either coupon samples or pigging samples. So some of you may not be familiar with these things. A coupon, hopefully you can see this here, is a small metal uh, disc that can be pulled out of a pipe and tested. The coupon is located inside the pipe, and so it's been exposed to all of the material, including the microbes, that the internal metal surface of the pipe has been exposed to. So this makes it a very practical surface for testing. Pigging, on the other hand, I love this name, is a really long vessel um, that they run through a pipe and which scrapes the side of the pipe as it moves through. So here's the pipe, here's the pig, and it pulls the material through the pipe and collects it at the end. This effectively cleans the pipe. Pigging ends up giving you a lot of material to look at compared to a coupon but may not necessarily give you very good insight into a biofilm that could be growing on the pipe's surface. So once we had the, piggy, the coupons and pigging material, we then had to optimize the DNA extraction um, process, which actually turned out to be pretty difficult from the coupons, as often there was not a lot of material on them, as well as the methodology for the sequencing, which includes choosing standard primers and conditions for the sequencing reaction. In the end, we successfully developed a standard protocol for speciation analysis from coupons and pigging samples. And with that, we were able to identify the community for 65 of the 66 samples provided to us. This protocol was then shared with third-party providers so that they could keep a consistent approach to analyzing all of it. So this is an overview of the process we developed. Um, for biologists, we simply just sequence a small part of the genome called 16S, assemble these into contigs, and then use this to understand which species are present. For the rest of you, I'm going to explain this just slightly differently. Basically, we amplify and sequence only one small part of the genome from each bacteria that's present in the sample, a part of the region we call the 16S ribosomal DNA. This region is really specific for each organism. So say the 16S of a bacteria called E. coli is very different from the 16S of a different bacteria like Pseudomonas. And so if we sequence these, we can tell who's there. These 16S regions, though, are similar enough that we can amplify them and sequence them together, but different enough that we can distinguish one type of bacteria from another. These 16Ss are small, but are large enough so that we end, um, we end up amplifying them in a few smaller pieces, which we then have to put back together like a jigsaw puzzle into what we call a contig. A full 16S contig is then compared to a database, which tells us which organism it belongs to. Once we have the 16S regions from the sample, we can then bucket the 16S sequences into distinct species and count how many of each we have. We then determine the taxa, or where from the tree and light the 16S comes from. 
so that we can understand the diversity of the bacteria present in the sample. Um, sometimes there's also archaea and, and fungi that we use in different set of primers for. And we can also then perform some advanced analytics to determine correlations between the samples or not. So once we have this list of bacteria present in the sample, what can we do with it? Well, using some of the advanced and the analytics capability we have in the BSC, we could start with clustering samples by their speciation profile. So in this example, we see a common visualization of speciation using stack bar plots. Looking at the core community this way, we can start to see how certain stack bars look similar. Now, to be honest, when we undertook this particular project, we were blinded as to where these samples came from. Once we completed the analysis, it looked like different samples were similar, and so they were lined up. And what we ended up finding was that we could see clustering of the different samples based on their associated metadata. So in this case, we had untreated versus biocide treated samples. And by also um, by the date, so we could look at untreated samples taken in September versus November. So here's another way to represent the same data, this time using hierarchical clustering. The main takeaway here is that we were able to classify the same samples by their speciation profile. And we still see the clusters of treated versus untreated and other metadata. By having the speciation data, we can now start making predictions. So imagine if one of these clusters was correlated with a high corrosion rate. One could potentially predict corrosion was occurring just from the speciation data. One could also hypothetically determine appropriate biocides to treat the bad actors. The BSC has microbial, metabolic, and physio physiology experts on staff that can work with the crews to determine the best treatments based on the species present. So what more could we do with this type of data? So we can also use machine learning on the speciation data for predictive analytics. Here, we're looking at a neural network used to classify if samples came from a coupon or a pig just an early way to, to test if the system could work. The neural network was found to be a better predictor than a linear model, as indicated by the mean, square, mean squared error and a coefficient of variation. After training the model, we found that we can utilize the speciation data alone as an input to effectively classify the sample. So for example, this model was 100% accurate in classifying if the sample came from a coupon or a pig, if it was treated with biocide or not, or if it came from a seawater inlet or not. If we add corrosion metadata, for example, things like corrosion rate, hydrogen sulfide production, pitting, metallurgy, elemental and analytical data, we may at some point be able to predict or diagnose corrosion or souring using the 16S speciation data alone. That could be a very fast and easy way to help operators diagnose and act quickly. So we can pretty easily determine who's in the sample how many of them are there, and look for correlations between the species present and the corrosion data. But is there a way to correlate this with physiological function? The answer is yes. So building on the speciation data we just went through, we can go further and use an additional analytical tools to further understand the physiology of the community. Using known reference genomes, we can infer the gene content of our microbial community. So knowing, say, that a 16S indicates that a particular species is present, we can predict which metabolic pathways are also likely present without having to sequence the entire genomes of the organisms present in the sample. So we use a program called PyCrux to do the prediction. For example, after feeding in the 16S information, PyCrux gives the abundance of the metabolic pathways predicted to be present in the sample. So in this case, um, and in this, you know, in this case, this particular sample 16S data um, indicated that pathways such as sulfur metabolism, shown here in red, and nitrogen metabolism, here in green, are present at very low levels in a water sample that was taken from the ocean near San Diego. We can also use this methodology to infer how the physiology of the population changes under different conditions. So as an example, you could compare a soured versus a nitrate controlled situation which could help in the understanding of the effect the nitrate is having on the population and offer insight into the souring levels to be expected over time. Or you could compare a pipeline before and after biocide treatment to understand the effectiveness of a biocide application and, and to potentially give insight into organism resistance, which could lead to better biocide choice. 
I'd also like to note here that we were made aware of the software through our connection with Professor Andrew McCain. So another example, we've used this methodology for an application studying the core microbial community and how it changes in PTA digesting anaerobic digesters. And this has been in conjunction with Professor Wenso Liu from the EBI and the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So this is a core issue for BP's downstream PTA business as the wastewater facilities are critical to each plant. If they don't work, then this can take the entire uh, production plant offline until it's fixed. So quite several questions were asked as part of the study, but the heart of it was, um, was what is the core microbial community in the anaerobic digesters? And is it different amongst the different reactor types because we have these in different parts of the world? So using the BSC genomics expertise, and that would be Tom, we built a 16S pipeline and ran this against 62 samples that had been sequenced in Wenso's group from the various anaerobic digesters used in the study. In the study. So the 16S profiles were, um, were then aligned. And for comparison, using those stacked bar charts. And quickly, you can start to see what the core communities look like for the various reactors in the study. Using this, we could then group similar communities, and once en masse, we could see that certain reactors, including those that were functioning better than others, actually had similar microbial communities, which suggests that then that the reactors that not aren't functioning as well could possibly benefit if we were to produce additional bacteria and infect them, um, so that similar so that they look like the same communities in the functioning reactor. So we believe that this is an important internal um, capability that we can use to evaluate external phylotyping results and to quickly determine and compare core microbial communities from any environment. Currently, we're working with our PTA wastewater team to query those core communities even further and look for ways in which we can improve the overall health of our anaerobic digesters at our PTA plants and at those of our licensees. As we think about next steps, it's truly about the pathways in the microbial communities as well as big data analytics. Areas that we're interested in are, include um, whole genome metagenomics and metatranscriptomics. So rather than just the species, how can we get an even better view into the metabolic pathways that are active in the microbial community? Though we can get a great picture using some of the tools I talked about today, we could be missing something important that we didn't know of because we haven't seen it before. We can look at network analyses. How can we easily correlate the various microbes under different conditions? So what kinds of information can be gleaned from these types of analyses? Canonical correspondence analyses, or CCA, can we develop this as a tool to determine which response variables are the most effective? Can we use bootstrap or random forest analysis to uncover which species are the most important in terms of the outcome? And finally, we want to continue to look using the neural networks, so this supervised machine learning, to, term, to determine if we can link a particular species to a particular response. So I hope you've enjoyed my talk today and had a glimpse as to what BP's new Bioscience Center is working on, and I will take any questions.